Okay, well, go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. My name is Cindy Cordova, and I am a Senior Assistant Director within the Board of Admissions here at Boston College. And on behalf of the entire BC community, we want to extend a warm congratulations for having been admitted to the class of 2025. We're so proud of you. And we really just wanna welcome you and help you learn a little bit more about our BC community through these webinars. This webinar series is called Get to Know BC. And today we're featuring um, some wonderful friends to the admissions office, Joe DuPont, who is going to go first with his presentation. He's the Associate Vice President uh, for Career Services. And after his presentation, we'll take a couple of questions and um, then we'll move on to Sal Cipriano, who is another great friend to the admissions office, a double eagle, actually, undergraduate studies, um, bachelor's degree from BC in 2010, and then his graduate degree in 2011. And now he serves as the assistant director of career education and the pre-law advisor. So we're in really good hands here this morning to learn a lot of information about um, these two wonderful opportunities that you have during your time here at BC. This session will be recorded, so you can also reference this information later on with your family members. Um, and another thing that we want to encourage you to do today is to add your questions to the Q&A box that is located at the bottom of your screen here. My colleague David Weber is behind the scenes and he'll be answering a lot of questions but then we'll also be able to answer some of those questions live um, with our wonderful speakers here today. So now without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Joe DuPont. Thanks so much, Cindy. Uh, welcome, everyone. We are really excited to talk with you today. Um, as Cindy mentioned, my name is Joe DuPont, and I'm the Associate Vice President for Career. And later on, you'll hear from my colleague, Sal Cipriano. Um, it's a great day in Boston if you're from another part of the country, and we really want to thank you for spending um, some of your time with us today to learn about how career education and pre-law advising work at Boston colleges and the services and the resources that we have for you. Um, I know that we have students on the call. Congrats again. Um, we also have parents, and I want to welcome you to the call as well. It's a really exciting time for your family. I have uh, a son in college, a uh, uh, a daughter who just graduated and we're on the way. So I think some of the information that you're getting, I've received as well um, from others. And it's really an important time in your life and an exciting one. So we hope we can help you uh, with that decision-making process. Um, as Cindy mentioned, you know, you're an incredible class. And so this presentation is more about, are, are we a good fit? Like, can you see yourself here? And when you think about career, does this sort of the, our approach uh, speak to you? We think it, you know, we obviously we think it will work for you. That's why we've admitted you into DC and hopefully it will make sense. So in terms of our presentation today, we're really just gonna talk a little bit about what makes um, our approach to career education distinct and unique as from a Jesuit perspective, how we approach our work, uh, just a few highlights. We, we do a lot, I encourage you to take a look at our website. I know some people are very interested in facts and figures. So we'll, we'll add a few of those as well. And again, you can go to our website or contact us later. Always happy to chat um, and give you more information and then leave some time for questions as well. So uh, for many parents who might be on the call, you know, career has really sort of elevated in, um, in terms of its presence on a campus since perhaps some of us um, were in college. So um, some of this information might be new to you as well. Um, if this is your first uh, son or daughter who goes to school. So our mission and our vision, this might seem a little unique to you, is something that we're really excited about. You know, we see career as one piece of living a broader, more meaningful life. And that's sort of what makes us, I think, unique as a Jesuit institution. Um, you're gonna spend a lot of time and work in terms of your career. It's a great vehicle for people to have impact. So uh, we wanna make sure that you're doing something that you know is inspiring to you. Um, that's the most important thing and allows you to have an impact in the way that you um, sees fit. So, and we'll explain a little bit more as we go throughout the presentation. Um, so two things, really this, we have a big emphasis on vocational reflect, reflection, how your skills and your values and your interests would help you, um, you know, uh, do what you want to do in the world. And the other piece is making sure that you're really prepared uh, for postgraduate success. Those two things go uh, very, very hand in hand in hand. So everything we do, you know, revolves around this mission. So just a couple of quick points. We are the centralized career center. We work with everyone here at BC. 
Um, by the time you're done your journey here, our goal is to have you feel confident and be able to explore different career paths, um, prepare, be feeling really prepared, and then know how to access the information and resources and people to help you, you know, select your next steps, whether that's grad school, fellowship, service, whatever happened it to be. I just want to reiterate too that we know that uh, having a meaningful career in life means many different things to different people, and we're here to support you all for that. So another thing that makes me really excited to work at Boston College is that the way that we organize our work, um, you know, Jesuit values are great career values. A Jesuit education is about personal formation and how you can have an impact on the world as you see fit. And so those things really resonate from a career perspective in terms of how we can organize our work. Um, so the same questions, you know, what brings you joy? What are you good at? What does the world need you to be? Translate incredibly well to career. Um, and the reason that's important, it's important for a couple of levels. It sort of means that career is sort of like baked into many things that we do here at BC and allows us to have a common language and to partner with people all over campus. Um, so career is not just the domain of our office, it's more of a university priority as we help you think about how you can understand your own talents and gifts, you know, and, and use them in the world. So as you make your decisions and as you go about thinking about your, you know, your where you want to go in terms of college, in terms of um, your next steps. One thing I'd like to point out to people, um, are just sort of like our staff size, numbers, how we approach our work. So as you're thinking about these decisions, I think one thing you might want to think about is how, you know, when we take the, the, the university makes it a priority, what does that mean? So in Boston College's case, we have 19 full-time professionals in our career center. We're very, very fortunate, um, but our staff really extends far beyond that. We have five graduate assistants, about 10 peer career coaches in any given time. Um, we have about 20 professionals embedded in other, um, you know, colleges throughout campus. So it really is like BC has made this uh, a priority. And we also want to make sure that we're, you know, sort of interacting with students in a way that they feel most comfortable. So there, there's two ways that we do that. And I'll explain one on the next slide. But we, you know, we have peer advisors that students can talk to. Sometimes students really want to just talk to someone else like who's sort of in the same circumstance. We have um, professionals that you can come talk to as well. People who do this like a living and, are, and like I said, our graduate student coaches like Sal. Um, and then we also have you know, industry professionals that we bring in a lot. And the way that we organize our work, um, I think is, is something that's really helpful to a lot of students. So when we think about our career education model, we really emphasize that we want people to sort of explore both personally, their skills and their values and their interests, and then different professions. And as we've evolved over time, we've taken on what we call a career cluster model. And by that, what I mean is this is how we organize our work. We are at a core, a liberal arts institution, and people find that very attractive. And so what that means is some students have a ton of broad interests, something that we completely understand. And so when they come here, or even when they're here, they have all sorts of exploration they want to do before they sort of double down on a career choice. Um, and so we have a team that's dedicated to help people with, you know, career exploration, like I said, those skills and their values and their interests. We also have six, what we call very broad industry clusters. There's all sorts of you know, subfields within all of these things, if you don't see the specific thing that you're interested in. So, you know, a student might come and say, I have to get a work study job, and I'd love for that to be somehow tied to what I want to do, but I don't, I don't know what I want to do. Maybe they start off with a career exploration coach. There'll be another student who walks in and says, I know I want to do media, and maybe I want to do something that's media and data. Um, and so maybe they would talk to our communications arts and media specialists. So it's, we really try to make it tailored. It's not like a one size fits all. You can see any and, you know, coach at any time. It's really up to you to really figure out, um, you know, at that moment, uh, what sort of uh, person would be the best fit for you. And we're really here to help. So the whole idea is to give people tailored advice and to meet them where they're at. So, you know, you'll speak to Sal later. Um, but like I said, like he's our resident experts on, you know, law, policy, and government. And so he's a great person to connect you to the resources, people, and opportunities in those fields. And so that's how we organize our work. And students have found it really effective. Uh, they can just identify where they're at and then identify the person they want to talk to. 
We have, this is just illustrative. We have all sorts of great programs. I'll dive in on, on one or two of these uh, in subsequent slides. We have tons of information, including videos on our website. Um, one of our more popular programs for sophomores, again, showing that institutional commitment to career education is, um, this year it was virtual, but we bring students back over winter break and host uh, a three-day career bonanza uh, of sorts. Um, and this year we had over about 300 students participate um, in order to help them, one, again, meet with our coaches and figure out a little bit more about what they want to do, then sort of how to make, make those bridges between their liberal arts education and what they might want to do next. That second day is uh, full of alumni panels and meeting alumni virtually. Um, and then the third day we have job tracks, whether they're in person um, or virtually this past year. It's a really tremendous program and many students get a lot of benefit out of it. We also know that there are many students who um, don't have the opportunity to do internships because if they're unpaid, they have to make money and that's a financial barrier. So we are very fortunate as a career center, as an institution, we give, depending on the year, about $275,000 away every summer to help students fund unpaid internships. They each get a $3,500 stipend. So again, that's sort of commitment. That's an institutional commitment in removing barriers for students. This coming May, we'll have our, our long running alumni shadow program will be up and running again. We have about 400 um, students uh, signed up for that um, for right now. Um, this is something you can do on your own, but it's also something that we organize um, over the course of the summer. We're looking to expand that as well. So you think about funding programs, connecting to alums, and then of course, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get to our facts and figures. Our students do incredibly well. We have all sorts of networking events and career fairs and lots of other things to help connect you to uh, employers. The BC brand is very strong and we're so fortunate to get to work with strong students like yourselves, which um, makes you attractive to them. So just to, again, I, tell, I said I would talk a little bit more specifically. Um, whatever institution you're looking at, I'm sure they have an alumni network. Um, we do too. Um, I feel incredibly fortunate by the Boston College um, you know, alumni network there. They really are very, very helpful. And so right now we have approximately about 12,000 people uh, in our, what we call Eagle Exchange, which is our online mentoring network, which connects students and alumni around the world. Um, and we really encourage you to take advantage of this. Alums are so generous with their time. And one of the silver linings of the a few silver linings of the pandemic is we've seen an opportunity to connect people literally all over the world to, to help our students with their career exploration. So we continue to expand this program. We'll have 20,000 members in this by the end of uh, the next fiscal year. Um, and it just continues to grow and get better and better. Uh, another thing I wanted to point out, as I mentioned, you know, we do, we've been creative in this past year, and I think it's a hallmark of the, of the staff and what they do. So even though we had to move to a virtual environment. Now this January for Endeavor example, we had more participants than ever. We had more alums than ever donate their time um, and spend time with us. And it was really an incredible program. So I think as you're thinking about um, your decisions, part of it is, you know, thinking about does that school have the resources and commitment? How, how far does the career community expand? Um, and we have some great examples here as you're, as you're thinking about your decision. Another uh, thing I wanted to point out, this is another great sort of like opportunity for the community to come together when we talk about careers and institutional um, commitment. So this May, in addition to the many opportunities we already have for students in honor of this class year, we're our, our own job and um, opportunity campaign in partnership with the Alumni Association. You can see the goals there um, on the screen to your right. But again, it just shows how incredibly uh, fortunate we are to have all these people are here to help students uh, with their career exploration and their next steps. Very excited about this. And then finally, um, I want to, you know, make sure that I, I know it's important for people. Um, I want to point some things out that are just fast facts. And again, happy to chat with you um, at any point in time. So last year we had about 21,000 student contacts, well, which is pretty incredible. About 60% of the class um, of the undergraduate student body worked with us in one capacity, which is pretty amazing considering that career is optional. You know, we, you decide how you wanna interact with us. 
Um, our placement rate in a time of a pandemic is remains very, very strong. We're very grateful for that. Um, so these numbers reflect the last class. And like I said, we have all sorts of events and career fairs, you name it. If you think about the clusters, we essentially do it. Um, and I really found it telling. I, I, I love that stat about 70% of our student body who graduates have used one of our resources um, or mentors, et cetera, to help them with their next steps. It goes back to that community and people wanting to be part of this. Um, and we have tons of opportunities for students. So I'll make that clear. So as you think about your process, uh, what I encourage, in addition to taking questions, what I encourage you to do is if you can, for any schools that you're thinking about, I often, parents and, and students ask me, how should I be approaching this from a career perspective? I just always encourage people to ask about like, you know, what's your career philosophy? Is just talking to other schools? So we're a cluster model. We organize ourselves that way. How do you operate? When you think about the institution, what's the commitment to career? How big is the staff? What are sort of the, the opportunities for cross collaboration between the schools and the career office? To that point about, again, is career a university priority or the domain of an office? How does the school do in terms of what either internships or experiential learning? You know, we average about, I think the last year, our, our data is being finalized now, about 86% of our students had at least one internship by the time they graduated and being close to Boston is really helpful with that. And then I think it's important for, for you to have confidence in the staff as well. We have a great staff. We're always thinking about things like the future of work and what that means in terms of the skill sets that your students or you will have to get. So hopefully that's a little helpful as you're, as you're going to other admitted um, days, but clearly we you know think highly of you and want you to come to BC. And so at this moment, I'll, I'll stop and I'll pause and see if, if you have any questions at this point in time. Thank you, Joe, for your incredible presentation. And we actually just shared uh, two links there uh, via the chat that you can click on to view um, the website for the Career Center, some of the outcomes that um, Joe talked about in terms of the class of 2020 graduates, a wonderful article actually with some uh, student testimonials. So you can see where students are at now. And that's truly a testament to the incredible work that you all did in your office uh, to reach out to students, make sure they were all safe and, safe and healthy, but also um, check in to see where they were at with their um, career goals. Um, and what you could do for them. So thank you again for all the hard work um, that you, your office put in countless hours um, during the pandemic. So one question that came in, Joe, is um, some students are wondering about federal work study. And they're wondering if the Career Center is a place where they can go to um, as a resource to, to seek um, some assistance with that. Can you just briefly address that? So the short answer is yes, we have a separate office here at BC that helps students align their work study allocation with jobs, both on campus and off campus. So we help with students with the off campus part. And then obviously we help them with all their materials uh, to make sure that um, they're prepared for that search. If you want to work at BC during the school year, there are opportunities for you. Wonderful. And then um, we have a question here from Andres, who is asking if besides the Career Center, do you know if other academic, if academic divisions individually have um, career centers that they can go to and if there's any collaboration between your office and their offices? Yeah, all of our work is collaborative. Um, so it's a great question. So <clears throat> if you look, we're, so we're the centralized career center. We work with everyone. All of recruiting runs through us, things like that. But we want our colleagues to have staff members embedded in their shops too. So, for example, the undergraduate um, business school has a has a great strong team. If you go to the communications department, there's an internship coordinator. Social work has their own people. So it's more like how do we all complement one one another's efforts, and with us taking the lead on, on much of that. But yes, it, it's just it's just it's I would say it's decentralized. I would say it's hybrid. It's centralized and we have people embedded throughout the schools. Okay, wonderful. And then is it okay to go to the Career Center as early as freshman year? We encourage it. So I think the reasons that people come are very, very different. So the work study question is a great example. So, you know, if you were just want some tweaks to your resume or want to learn more about how to apply for those jobs, come on in. If you're thinking about how 
your classes that you're thinking about taking, you know, how do those relate to career? Come on in. You know, if you want to understand some of that data and how that works, come on in. I will say, so we meet students wherever they're at. I will say, if you want to set a goal for yourself, it would be great to see you at least once your freshman year in some capacity, meeting with our staff or a peer or someone. But most people start, <clears throat> you know, sort of like gently tipping their toes in the water, starting the ground a little bit more their sophomore year. But there's no rhyme or reason to that. We present a all sorts of freshman classes all the time. We'll talk again at orientation and welcome week. So we really do want to integrate career into the student experience. And, and when you're, you know, your first year, a lot of those questions, you might come in and want to talk about your resume, but we'll, we might push back gently and really talk about, you know, what do you want to, what brings you joy? Like, how can you study what you love and also get a job later on? Or, you know, the most important thing you can do in terms of a career your first year is probably join a club and get really acclimated to the community so you have a good experience at BC. So we work with everyone, but we'll sort of kind of gently prod as to why, why we're working with you that early. Wonderful. Another question, Joe, is about the city of Boston and how students are using those resources um, to find those internships to connect with alumni from all over the world, but in particular in the city of Boston, how are you partnering uh, for different opportunities? Yeah, we, we're very fortunate. We have the green line right next to campus. You know, the Career Center is, we're members of the Chamber of Commerce. We do a lot with them. Many of our employers who have a relationship with Boston. And like I said, there's so many opportunities for <clears throat> internships and academic credit through departments that we work very closely with um, departments to help arrange those things. If you, we're very, very fortunate. We do a lot with employers in the city of Boston. And during these times um, with the pandemic and um, social distancing, what has shifted in terms of how you conduct programming, career fairs? Yeah, career fairs was a big one. So we were almost completely virtual, um, like most parts of campus. <clears throat> Although students could continue to use our interview rooms for interviews that they were conducting on their own virtually. Um, but it was pretty seamless. Like I said, um, we, we made that transition. It was a lot of work to make sure that we could do that. We always wanna be in person, that is our goal. But like, as I mentioned, our Endeavor numbers were higher than ever. Our career fair registration was higher than it was last year. Um, so we want to be in person. Don't get me wrong. But I think we've, we found a way to, to sort of make it work. And even the coaching appointments, like, like I mentioned, students really seem to like Zoom a lot in terms of being able to talk to someone, make that a little bit easier, even though our preference is always to be in person. Mm -hmm. Last question here, Joe. Um, you talked a, a little bit about the high level of care and um, attention that is placed on advising, this holistic sense of advising students. So we have a student here who's asking, how does a career center work with students who are completely undecided about what they want to do for their major and for their careers? In other words, that's completely normal. So that, that's a, lot, a big chunk of our student body probably including many of us on the staff. Many of us are academic advisors, so we felt the same way. That's very normal. So um, it's, it's not unique. You might feel like you're alone, but a lot of students feel that way, particularly um, you know, if they have a lot of broad interests, which is very attractive to a place like BC. So some way we would start with that is really start talking to them about like what classes are they selecting and why? Like what excites them about them? What did they do in high school that they found fun? Or how did they enjoy that? Did they know that their skills that they were getting translated to things that employers want? So it's it's very, you can start very, very gently and softly down that road. Um, but if, if it's, I think it's sort of liberating, you know, most BC students and students around the country will change their major at least once or add a major because college is supposed to be transformative. You'll start somewhere and have these sort of, you know, revelations about what you want to do as time goes on. So I don't want students who are undecided or undeclared to feel like they're behind because they're not. And it, like I said, it's pretty, it's pretty normal. Absolutely. Well, thank you again. We invite you to stick around in case there are any other questions at the end of the presentation. Um, but now we're going to turn it over to Sal. So um, thank you again, Joe. Thank you, everyone. I'll, I'll be here.
Welcome back, Sal. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. I'm just going to share my screen real quick. All right. Well, um, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here um, to uh, spend some time chatting with you all. So uh, as Cindy and Joe already mentioned, my name is Sal Cipriano. Uh, I am an assistant director of career education uh, at the Boston College Career Center. Um, I oversee that government law and public policy cluster. Um, Joe had mentioned the cluster, so that's the one that I oversee. Um, I also serve as the university pre-law advisor. Um, so law is encapsulated very much in what I do. As Cindy already mentioned, I also am a double legal. Um, I graduated in 2010 with my bachelor's degree and then did my master's. Um, after that, I got my PhD at Fordham. Um, so very much ingrained in Jesuit education. But um, you know, the, the fact that you're all in the class of 2025 is, that is breathtaking, um, really. I'm also a Long Islander, so if there's anybody uh, from Long Island, hello. Um, great to see you. There's lots of us here at Boston College. So I want to start with this quote from the American Bar Association, because um, it really is drives a lot of our approach to pre-law Boston College. Uh, there is no single path that will prepare you for a legal education. Students who are successful in law school and who become accomplished professionals come from many walks of life and educational backgrounds. Students are admitted to law school from almost every academic discipline. And as I mentioned, this is kind of the mantra that encapsulates our approach to pre-law at Boston College. Uh, we recognize that students interested in legal careers come from a diverse array of backgrounds and have many different reasons for wanting to pursue a legal career. Uh, therefore, what's most important for BC students is that they pursue their interests regardless of how relevant they, they may or may not be to law school. Ultimately, the genuine pursuit of one's interests is the best way to eventually go to law school. I saw a question actually come through in the Q&A um, earlier about like, you know, what if I want to do uh, applied second neuroscience? I'm like, excellent. 100% do that. Um, you can major in anything and you can go to law school. And I mean that. So what does it mean though to be pre-law at Boston College? Um, unlike the pre-med track, which some of you might be familiar with, there is no set major or course requirements or plans of study to be pre-law at Boston College. Um, if you are so interested, you can declare your interest in being a quote unquote pre-law student. Uh, at the Office of Student Services in Lyons Hall. Um, all pre-law students who are registered will receive a bi-weekly email from me with news, events, resources, and opportunities um, that we really encourage you to take advantage of. Um, I also tend to share important updates from the Law School Admissions Council. That's the body that oversees the, the LSAT, um, the entire admissions and applications process. Um, about important deadlines and important announcements. Put another way, being a pre-law student is a really good way to be plugged in about news, opportunities, and updates relevant to the law school admissions process. But again, regardless of whether you are officially declared as pre-law or not, and I meet with plenty of seniors, for instance, who applied to law school who had no idea that they could even uh, declare as pre-law, um, all students are welcome to meet with me throughout the year to discuss their interests, to discuss their applications. And truly, this means any student. So to Joe's point uh, before, this includes first-year students um, who are thinking about their interest in law, want to maybe have a chat about what that would look like, what maybe some ways that they can do to prepare, um, to a senior who is very much in the thick of applications. Um, you know, it's April. It is, we are in law school admission season. So I've been meeting with a lot of seniors uh, over the past few weeks, um, you know, who've gotten received admissions decisions back and who are thinking about which law school they want to be at next year. Um, and as a side note, um, I love reading personal statements. Um, I have no problem taking the red pen to them to ensure that you are clearly and compellingly articulating uh, your experiences and your interest in making your case for law school. And this is really truly one of the best parts of my job work in being the pre-law advisor because it's a really great way to learn about student motivations, your reasons for wanting to go to law school. As BC students, um, there is a real commitment to social justice, to pursuing justice and equity 
Um, and so it's great to see students, um, BC students in particular, who want to address these things and see law school uh, as a way to pursue justice um, and equity in, in, all different, um, in all different walks of life. Um, I also want to mention that for uh, students in the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences particularly, there is a special program with BC Law School. Uh, this is known as the 3 plus 3 program. Um, what it means is that during your junior year, should you so choose, you can apply to BC Law School. To, and if you're admitted, you would start law school in what would have been your senior year. Um, so there's, there's some pros to this, right? You um, do undergrad in law school in six years as opposed to seven years. Um, you get to attend an elite law school, um, which is, uh, you know, BC Law School is, you know, right down the block from us in Newton. So it's a really fantastic opportunity. There's certainly some cons like financial aid and whatnot, only doing undergrad in three years, um, kind of giving up your senior year. That's certainly something I'm happy to chat about a bit more, but it is a fantastic opportunity. Uh, this year, you know, we have, I believe it's three 1Ls, um, so they would have been seniors this year, but now because they were admitted to BC Law on the 3 plus 3 program last year, they are now first year uh, law students at Boston College Law School. Um, again, happy to ch chat about that a bit more, uh, but that is a program that is specific for students in the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences. But ultimately, um, our goal and my role is not to get you or get any student into the best law school. My role is to make sure that you make the best career choice for yourself, whether that means going to law school or, decide, or deciding that ultimately law school is not for you. So as I mentioned, we regularly host events, notify students about opportunities to explore the legal world. Um, you know, in the past, in the before times, as I call it, we led treks to places like Ropes and Gray, uh, which is a major American law firm that occupies the top 20 floors of the Prudential Tower in Boston. So easily the best, the coolest um, law, law firm I've been to with the best views of the city of Boston. Um, we also have, a very, as Joe alluded to already, we have a very strong and tight-knit alumni community, speaking as an alum, but also as someone who works regularly with alumni. Um, we love and alumni love connecting with students and we regularly hold alumni chats and panels, including our HANA alumni and law and policy panel, uh, which we hold every February. Um, our alumni are fantastic resources. Um, there's a good chance that if you're interested in law while a BC student, there are going to be just a ton of opportunities for you to engage with BC alumni working in various legal fields. Um, but even with the pandemic, we've been, and again, Joe mentioned this already too, um, we've been able to host a series of virtual programs that still allow students to connect with alumni and explore their interests in law. Um, our most recent one, we had a women in law alumni panel. Uh, this has been great because we've been able to engage alumni from all over the country with alumni joining us from DC and Texas and California, as well as right down the block in the city of Boston. Um, we've also had a series of conversations and workshops where students uh, can log in and ask their questions and gain insight uh, about the law school application process. Um, having said that, there are ample ways to get involved uh, and explore your interest in law as a BC undergraduate. Uh, we have two fantastic student groups, the Bellarmine Law Society and the Ahana Pre-Law Student Association. Um, I work closely with both of these groups throughout the year. Uh, we host events, we host application workshops, and we host a number of different opportunities to network with legal professionals. Um, throughout the year, and especially during the fall semester, which is like the height of law school application season and recruitment season, um, we also have a number of law schools visit campus. Um, and I put visits in quotes there because all those visits were virtual uh, in this fall, but. Um, in, in many ways, we were able to host even more schools than we normally do. Um, and this past fall, we had a large number of students attend these info sessions and connect with admissions folks from law schools. These sessions are not only great for seniors who, might be, who are like in the thick of law school applications, um, but they're also really great for uh, first-year students and for sophomores, right? Underclassmen, um, 
to gain a sense of specific law schools, to think about applications, to, to start networking and connecting with law schools. This is networking and making connections with law school representatives is such an essential component of the law school application process. And these law schools love recruiting BC students. Um, half the time, I don't even need to reach out to them. They reach out to me and it's like, hey, when can we come and do a session with Boston College students? Uh, we can't get enough of you all. So um, this is an opportunity, again, you can start laying the groundwork. Should you be a first year student, um, decide to come to BC, come the fall, look out for these because they're a great way to, again, learn about the process and start connecting with some fantastic law schools. Joe mentioned this too, but I want to dive a little bit into internships as well. BC students undertake an array of internships in the legal, political, and government fields. Um, on this screen, you'll see uh, several examples, uh, to put it mildly, of uh, where students undertook legal-related internships in both summers 2019 and 2020. Um, I actively work with students to find and secure these opportunities, but it's important to note that while there are normally uh, ample opportunities for students, legal internships are by no means a requirement for law school. Um, it's a great way to explore the field, to determine whether law is right for you. Um, but law schools are not expecting that you have had any legal experience. Put another way, the word law can appear nowhere on your transcript, on your resume, and you could be a fantastic um, candidate for law school. Rather, these are fantastic ways to build skills and to explore the field further. Last year at this time, um, you know, really in like the very early days of the pandemic, I was happy that I was still able to work with a number of students who undertook fantastic internships uh, in the fields of law, government, and politics, uh, and more. Uh, many were remote in format, but they were still awesome experiences for students. Um, I was really, really impressed and very happy to work with re resilient BC students then and now, because we're still very much applying to summer internships uh, who continue to pursue their passions, uh, even during these difficult times. You know, just as a side note, I got to work with one student who did a legal internship with the US, uh, Army Air, uh, US Air Force JAG Corps in Germany. Um, and it was, I mean, it was really cool for me because I get to kind of like intern vicariously through students at all these amazing, amazing organizations. Um, many of these opportunities also are funded by our office because they tend to be unpaid. So a number of these students who undertook some of these amazing legal internship opportunities, whether it was uh, particularly in the public sector for state and local government or government agencies like the DOJ, U.S. Attorney's Office, the Massachusetts court system, um, New York court system, um, they, they, we are able to fund them uh, through that Eagle Intern Fellowship. Okay, so that's just a really rough overview, a broad overview of what pre-law is at Boston College, but how do BC folks do um, in terms of going to law school? Um, and the answer is BC students and BC alumni, they go anywhere and everywhere. Um, so um, I believe one of my colleagues, Cindy or David, is gonna share a, a document with you uh, in the chat that kind of gives a bit more of an overview of our BC uh, quick facts in terms of where students and BC alumni go to law school. But this is what you see on the uh, screen right now, in particular on that map. Those are the top 25 schools uh, in this most recent uh, cycle, 2019-2020 by admits. Um, and as you can see, we have top locations. Obviously, a lot of students are going to Boston College Law School. That's the law school right down the block. Uh, this law schools in Massachusetts uh, and New York, as well as DC and Pennsylvania this past year. Um, certainly our Jesuit, uh, our friends at Fordham and Georgetown see a number of BC students and they also love recruiting BC students, as well as a number of T14 law schools. You know, UPenn, NYU, Columbia, Yale, BC students do very, very well. But this is also illustrative of the fact that BC students, um, they go to law school throughout the country. You know, I just had a really great uh, conversation with a, a student yesterday where she came to me and she was kind of, you know, a little, you know, a little anxious about like, I have, you know, I have a, almost a full ride to Boston College Law School, but I'm also admitted with some scholarships to NYU and Georgetown. I'm like, what a fantastic problem to have. Let's have this conversation. 
Um, so BC students do very well. Um, BC students are also welcome to meet with me anytime to chat about their applications. And like I said, from the very first moment, you're like, hmm, maybe a law school, uh, maybe law school is for me. I want to have a chat about that. Right on down to, all right, I'm figuring out which law school I want to put a deposit into. Um, we can have that conversation. Another thing of note is that you may want to see, you, you may kind of recognize here that, well, this is probably a bit more than BC seniors, right? Um, maybe you determine that you want to apply to law school after you graduate a year or two down the road. We have lots of BC alumni who do that and you can work with our office for up to five years post-graduation um, to uh, not only on your law school application, but for any, um, but for any career aspect as well. So with that, um, I'm gonna pause and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you, Sal. Some wonderful information there. We actually just shared a PDF with all the facts and figures uh, via the chat. So you can click on that link that was sent by my colleague, David Weber, and you'll have all that information available to you as well. So we have some great questions here in the Q&A box. And um, just to reiterate what you said earlier about students being able to study anything here at BC and still being able to be in the pre-law track, um, are there any specific classes that you would encourage them to take uh, nonetheless? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I wanna remind, you might've seen in a few places, I'm gonna go back a little bit, bc.edu slash prelaw, we have a ton more information on there, including some suggested courses. Um, one way to think about courses is um, courses that will help you prepare for law school and courses about law. Right? So courses that will help you prepare for law school is really any course that's getting you reading, writing, and thinking critically in a big way. So your core liberal arts courses um, are going to do that. Um, having said that, you know, courses like public speaking, uh, logic in the philosophy department, um, I'm going to give a shout out to Latin as well, um, for, not only for grammar, but for uh, complex legal concepts, um, are also are great electives one might consider in terms of preparing for law school. But certainly any liberal arts course is going to help you prepare. Um, but then there are courses about law, right? So we have an entire business law and society department uh, in the Carroll School of Management that even, that even if you're not in the Carroll School, uh, students can take. It's very popular. Um, there are courses throughout the history and political science departments about, legal, uh, about different legal topics um, that one can take to learn about the law. We also have a fantastic, very popular environmental law and policy course that students are able to take. I believe it's their sophomores and junior years. And it's actually offered through the Boston College Law School and it's taught by 3L students, so final year law school students from BC, BU and Harvard Law Schools. Um, it's taught like a law school class and if students uh, do well in that class, they're able to get a recommendation to take an actual course at Boston College Law School. Uh, in the year after they take that environmental law and policy course. I often meet with a lot of students who I took environmental law and policy. I want to go to law school now because it was such a fantastic experience for them. Uh, but there is a number of courses that you can take to explore, to build skills. Um, certainly, you know, when you're on campus or, you know, on virtually on campus in the fall, we'll see what happens. But feel free to meet with me. We can go over that. Fantastic. Um, you mentioned exploration, and certainly we have many students who will be taking different classes and maybe following not only uh, pre-law, but also maybe pre-health, pre-med programs as well. Um, have you had students who have been able to do to be both pre-med, pre-health, and then on top of that study their major? Um, yeah, so uh, certainly students who are, I can't speak specifically to pre-med and pre-health, but certainly students who who are on the pre-med track can major in anything um, because pre-med is a specific um, is a specific uh, track of classes regardless of your like beyond your major even uh, for pre-law the beauty of it is that again there 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 are no classes you have to take so you can be pre-law and you can be a bio major right you can take classes like you might be taking as a pre-med major um, I actually worked with a student last. Um, 
last year who was a bio bachelor's and he was a master's student in bio as well. And we worked on his law school application. So absolutely, it's something uh, you can do uh, is pursuing that major of interest while keeping kind of a professional track in mind, whether that is thinking about law school or very much doing the pre-med track. Great. Um, another question here is about the three plus three program. So being ah. in, yeah, six years instead of seven years. Can yep. you talk a little bit more about um, any success, success stories uh, of students who have been able to, to be admitted to this program? Absolutely. So it is a new program. So we don't have like a ton of students. However, um, our, our fir the first person to ever uh, graduate from the three plus three program, she actually graduated in 2020. So, uh, so uh, last last May 2020. And she has a fantastic, uh, she just started a fantastic career as a corporate lawyer at a major law firm in Boston. Um, so that is our first major success story, because um, that's, she was the first person to do it. And as I mentioned, we do have um, three students now who were juniors last year who I was able to work with who are now 1L students at Boston College Law School. And Obviously, they are incredibly busy at 1L students, but in my interaction with them, uh, they seem to be thriving and really enjoying it. Um, it is a lot of work, though. So, like, you know, just to maybe head off any other questions, you know, it involves finishing your major, um, it involves finishing your language requirement and a certain amount of credits or core by the end of your junior year. Um, so it's definitely something that if it's if this is something that like you're interested in explore further, um, it's a great conversation to have probably about like the beginning of your sophomore year, um, just so we can make sure that you are you know, have all your ducks in a row and are able to um, really not be you know trip up with any of the requirements because you know you're still applying to an elite law school, um, so we want to make sure that. You know, not only is your application strong, but you're also, you know, maintaining your eligibility as well. Wonderful. And I'm sure the LSAT is part of that process as well. Absolutely. Yep. Any preparation that BC offers? So BC does offer a, does have a series of test prep services for the LSAT and other uh, graduate exams. Um, it is offered periodically throughout the year and in the early summer. So yes, BC does have a test prep service, um, but if you're thinking, you know, at the point at which you're thinking about the LSAT is very much the point that I want to talk to you because I want to, there is no one way to study for the LSAT. Um, so for, you know, you might find that the, that, you know, test prep and a structure of a class is what you need, but you might find that actually like that doesn't work well for me. And so I'm more than happy to go over the range of resources and strategies that you can use to study for the LSAT, um, including identifying key resources. Um, as well as, you know, cost effective resources as well, because law school is expensive and applying to law school is expensive. So that's also a conversation um, and resources that I like to have and share with students. Wonderful. Now, I know this number might fluctuate year by year, but on average, um, how many students will you say enroll in law school immediately after completing undergraduate at BC? Yeah. Okay. So love this question. Um, I would say that in any given time, the, the incoming class of BC students and alumni going to law school would range anywhere from like 25% seniors to 75% alumni who took some time off, anywhere from like 25% to like 30 to 40% and 75% down onto 60%. And I say that, and so that those numbers might be like, oh no, like if I'm a senior, right? I shouldn't apply to law school, right? Because I'm not going to get it. No, you should apply to law school when you want to go to law school. That is true. That is, you will hear every law school admissions representative from every law school say that. What I mean by that, though, is that there are always going to be more alumni, maybe because alumni might decide three, four, five, six years down the road that, hey, I want to go to law school. There's always going to be more alumni who've graduated a year or two out and up um, more alumni applying to law school than seniors. So for you, if you decide that, you know, maybe now it's not time for me to go to law school, fantastic. Um, if you decide, no, now is the time, fantastic, right? This is, you know, it's entirely your decision and we will work on your application and what your next steps are, regardless of when you decide to pursue law school. Great. And then I guess, I guess just to kind of wrap up some of the information that you have already shared, we have a question yep. here. What are some of the things that students should be doing throughout undergrad to put forward a strong law school application? 
Yeah, pursue your interests. Um, and I mean that. Law schools um, are very interested in students who have pursued their interests, right? It's very easy to cut through the law schools for cut to kind of cut through things that might seem like, oh, did they just do that because they think it would look good? Or did they do that because they're truly interested in it, right? So I mean that. Um, your interests could be politics, law, government, then go for it. It could be media, it could be bio, it could be chem, go for it, right? Take your coursework seriously, right? Uh, by all means, please take your coursework seriously, but explore, challenge yourself. And by all means, not only just your coursework, but pursue those things on campus that you are interested in, right? Whether that's extracurricular, whether that's volunteering, whether that is internships, um, those, that's how you build a strong law school application because a law, every law school application is unique because no one law school applicant is the same. Your goal is to make you know, your story compelling, right? Put another way, if you don't have a compelling reason to go to law school, you have a compelling reason not to go to law school. So my, my role is to kind of help you think about that, right? And the way that you think about those interests and the way that you think about you know, what a compelling application um, looks like is, well, to what extent have you been pursuing the things that really spark in your interest the most and motivate you the most? So thanks so much for your presentation. That was wonderful. No um, I'm gonna now bring back Joe so that we can all be together and answer any final questions that have come through the Q&A box. Welcome back, Joe. <laughs> Great, awesome. So um, obviously a lot of information was shared today and students are curious to know, um, but really like how often are students from BC sought after for internships and opportunities uh, by alumni or employers in the area? I don't know if you have any, any stories that you could share maybe um, or any stats that could be helpful here. Yeah, they're like BC students do incredibly well. I, I can't reiterate that enough. So. If you think about, like, and if you look at that outcome data, the link that Cindy circulated, you'll see there's references to what percentage of BC students have done internships by the time they graduate, and it's incredibly high. Um, we also just launched a new feature this year where alums now can post project work for students to do. So even if it's not a full-blown interest uh, internship, if they have something that they want a student to work on, a student can do that to help build school skills. So it's a very, very strong network and students who wanna work or intern, there are ample opportunities to do that online, you know, virtually through project-based work and hopefully soon again in person. So you wanna add anything else? Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll add that. Um... You know, part of my broader role as a government law and public policy coach, I've been able to really make some great connections with employers and alumni working in the field. And so like, I'll give one example of the Department of International Trade with the U.S. Commercial Service. Um, love BC students. Like they participate in so many events. They're constantly recruiting BC students as interns. And I feel like as if we've had an intern at that office, um, geez, every semester in summer since I started. Um, so um, there's certainly, you know, the recognition that you know BC students have a lot to offer, um, and so they're def like employers notice, um, and that's why they keep coming back. Certainly, I know that also when I connect with alumni, they're always letting me know, you know, hey, I have uh, some openings here, or you know, if you have any students who are interested, let me know. And it's a it's a community, right? So mm -hmm. that's another way how we can spread the word uh, for students to get involved. And I guess you know, as we have a, a few more minutes here before we wrap up. If there's any advice that you could give to our incoming students um, in general terms, you know, what will you say to them as incoming freshmen uh, or even as students who are still trying to finalize their decisions? Because we know we have many students on the call who already made their decisions. They were early decision applicants, but we also have regular decision students who are still trying to finalize uh, the process here uh, by May 1st. So any words of wisdom advice that you would like to share with them? I would personally say, like, listen, trust your gut, like, listen to your inner voice. If you're going to these presentations and you are liking what you're hearing and you can see yourself in the community, trust that. Um, and then from a Boston College perspective, I would say, you know, it really, it really is a great community. It's a, and, you know, we're, we're a relatively big school 
uh, with, you know, 15,000 students all together, 9,000 undergrads, but the community is very tight. And even geographically, it's like very easy to all be together. So I would, I would just encourage you to, like I said, listen to your, to your, what you're hearing and see how much of that really resonates with you. In terms of specifically with career, um, if you have a specific question, anything, you should always ask it. We're here to help. But I would say, you know, in my role and as a parent, you know, getting acclimated to college, making some friends and getting involved is means you're going to ultimately have success in college, which is probably the most important thing that you can do to have success after college afterwards as well. Yeah, and I mean, I agree with everything that Joe just said. Um, trust your gut, you know, go to the place that feels right to you. Um, I will say that in kind of speaking as a, I mean, I was a first generation college student. And so going to a place like BC, one thing that I can really emphasize is that there's kind of like a sense of wonder when it comes to being on a campus, especially like Boston colleges, like there's so much going on. There's, and it can almost be overwhelming, but flip that, reframe it. Make that, like, make that your advantage. Explore, ask questions, get out of your comfort zone. Um, that, to Joe's point, I think that's really how you can get the most out of your college experience. Um, you know, this is a uh, four years goes by, I, and saying this now, knowing that you're a class of 2025 and knowing when I graduated, it goes like that. So, um, you know, take advantage of the fact that, you know, you're going to be there for four years, that you're going to have a lot of opportunities to explore, to try new things. Uh, things that are probably brand new to you, you've never heard of before. Um, you know, do, no matter if it's Boston College or another university, like use that to your advantage um, and take that opportunity to try those new things. Well, it's truly been a pleasure to be with you all this morning. Thank you, Sal. Thank you, Joe. Thank you to everyone who tuned in, students, parents, guardians, family members. We are just so happy and proud of you. And we hope that you found this information to be helpful. Um, please stay safe and well and healthy. And we wish you a wonderful rest of your weekend. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, everybody. Bye.